Jamie Vinnick of kookfan.com joins us now. And Jamie, I, I know, like, we're going to talk about realignment in a second and the Cougs really unfortunate position in all of this. Uh, but for them to be right now, a team that the rest of the PAC 12 is scared of that is playing a team in Oregon state that the rest of the PAC 12 is scared of in a game for even so much more than the, just this win. What's the vibe around Pullman right now? Oh, it's, um, it's certainly buzzing. There's a lot of people in town. Um, a lot of Coug fans I haven't seen a lot of B fans yet, but I'm sure they'll be here sometime uh, later on. But, you know, I think there's a lot of anticipation for this game. You know, when you take out all the realignment uh, stuff and all, you know, the, the unity between these two schools, it's a big football game. You know, you're talking about two ranked teams, two 3-0 and teams, and two teams who have aspirations this season. And, you know, one of those teams is going to come out of this 4-0 with a rank with a ranked win. If it's Washington State, they will have two ranked wins under their belt. If it's Oregon State, they'll have their first big win of the season playing a soccer non-conference schedule. So, you know, I think both ADs and coaches and everyone has kind of said, you know, for about four hours on Saturday, three and a half hours, all that, uh, you know, that brotherhood, that partnership, that's off the table because these are still two programs who want to go out and win this game. And, you know, if they want to reach their potential and get to where they want to be, they need to win this game. You know, uh, Cam Ward is from here in Texas. He went to UIW, and then now he's become this huge star. What has been the biggest part of his growth where he would have times last year where he looked like this, and then a drive later he would look maybe a little bit um, out of his helmet for a little bit. But now it appears he has completely taken control, and he is one of the most lethal players in the Pac-12. Yeah, I think it's a variety of things. Um, you know, the first thing is Ben Arbuckle comes in as the new OC, and they immediately change a lot of Cam's mechanics. You know, he was he would backpedal last year when he dropped back, go all the way back, and then run himself into trouble. His drops are crisper this year. He's taking a three-step drop and getting the ball out. You know, I think Arbuckle's play calling and his, uh, his scheme and his designs are a lot simpler, but also a lot more effective. You know, Eric Morris – he ran a lot of bubble screens last year. There was a lot of reasons for that, but they were ineffective. Arbuckle gets the ball out quick. He uses his playmakers. He spreads the offense out, and he runs it at a high tempo. And then I think you look at the offensive line. It's a lot better than it was last year. And to me, one of the biggest things is the receivers. Well, these receivers were not good enough last year. They were soft on the ball. They did not block well. That has completely changed. These guys have really, really stepped up. Lincoln Victor, in particular, has got 342 yards. I think he's 11th in the country in yards, six maybe in reception. He's a guy that has kind of helped Washington State change their offense to, into what they want it to look like. So I think it's a collection of things. And Ward has certainly gotten better and taken strides, but he's had a lot of help around him, too, that he maybe didn't have last year. Jamie, how much has the realignment thing defined this season going in for Jake Dykert and the Cougars? You know, I think Jake has said uh, – quite often that they're not going to let it be a distraction. They're going to put in the, you know, on the back burner. There's only so much you can do that. I, I know the guys are thinking about it. I mean, Dickert goes out after the Wisconsin game and says we belong in the power five. So it's on his mind. It's on the mind of the players. But, you know, I think Dickert's a coach that he focuses so much on preparation and culture that these guys, you know, when it comes time for the field, they're bought in. Their mindset is what they say, go and want to know every week. And it's cliche. A lot of coaches use that. But I think there is a, a focus on the field. Um, you know, I'm sure there's – I know there's frustration. I know that, you know, for Dickert, for a lot of the coaches at Washington State and for a lot of the players who will be back next year, they think they should be Power 5, and a lot of evidence suggests that they should. Uh, but I think they've done a pretty good job of, of tuning it all out and just going out and playing football. And, you know, the results so far have been pretty good. So what is the future of the Pac-2 and the Mountain West and – possible relegation what do you think that is going to come out of the of this you know maybe radical model that they are are coming up with well that's the that's the million dollar question i mean i think the dream for for wazoo and oregon state fans is they find a big 12 invite along the way i don't know how plausible that is but i think that's still the, the hope they're holding out for that they get into the big 12 and they they retain that power status you know otherwise it probably looks like some kind of merge with the Mountain West, or, you know, there is a possibility that they hang out for a couple of years and see what opens. They get a, a two-year grace period, 
that they can, if they really wanted to, operate as the Pac-2 and, you know, go quote-unquote independent until they find where they want to go next. And I think, you know, the mindset behind that would be, with the amount of realignment we've already seen, there's another domino or 10 still to fall. You know, how much longer are Clemson and Florida State in the ACC before someone else comes calling? You know, how many of these schools going to new conferences you know, realize uh, this was a wrong decision. Maybe we need to backtrack. So I think there's a lot of variables that, you know, present the opportunity to perhaps do that little pack two idea. But I also think there might be some desire to get stability and say, okay, we're just going to join the Mountain West. And if something else opens up, we'll see what happens. I would just think the logistical nightmare of scheduling everything that has been taken away from you automatically would be, would be really hard to pull that one off. No, and I think that is definitely one of one of the concerns is, okay, you've got, you know, 10 months, 12 months to the next football season. You've got to find yourself, you know, you assume they play each other and Washington State's got Portland State on the schedule, so they'll play them no matter what. Then you got to find, you know, nine, ten games, and a lot of teams have their schedules finalized, you know, and that what, what does that turn into? That turns into Washington State either playing a very soft schedule or having to play a lot of these teams – that are going into the Big Ten or Big 12 who need to schedule games as well. And I, I don't know if that's the, the best idea for Washington State. So there is certainly a logistical issue of, hey, we're going to go independent and we're going to find nine games to schedule, ten games to schedule. Great, you've got eight months to do that. You know, you're, you're not going to get the schedule you want. It's either going to be extremely challenging or extremely easy. Do you think fans would embrace the relegation model? I do. I, I actually do. I mean, just kind of looking around Twitter and what people have said. And I think a big reason for that is, is, you know, the view of Washington State fans, and I think Oregon State fans as well with the last couple of years, is, you know, they wouldn't be in danger of relegation based on that model. Pat Dunn said as much yesterday that, you know, if you went to some kind of model like this, the way Washington State has played over the last now seven to eight seasons, they're not in danger of that. I mean, it'd be one thing if we're talking about a, a perennial four and eight program that, Hey, they've had an occasional year, but you know, every year since 2015, save the COVID season, Washington State has made a bowl game. Um, you, you know, and, and not necessarily the you know a high end game every year. There's a little lot of seven, eight win seasons, but you know, this is a program who is cons- that is consistently beating teams with more talent, with better recruits, with with all these advantages, and that comes down to coaching development and so on. So, I, I do think Coop fans would be very open to this relegation system. Just because, uh, you know, at least right now, it's hard to see a scenario in which they're really in danger of getting relegated. Jamie, when did you feel that the Pac-12 was legitimately in trouble? Oh, I, I, honestly, for me, it was that Friday morning when you wake up and see that Washington and Oregon are leaving. Uh, we were at, uh, at fall camp. I forget what day of practice, day two or three of practice. And there had been the early morning rumors that, hey, there might be this thing that's coming together to keep it all intact. And um, and then when, once Washington and Oregon left, I didn't see a future for it. I thought, you know, it would be tough without the L.A. schools, but I thought it would still survive. Um, you know, I think when Colorado left, the reaction of a lot of people was whatever. I mean, Colorado had been in the conference for years, and as Dan Lanning said, that Oregon said, yeah, they didn't do a whole lot while they were here. Granted, that's changed a little bit this season with, with Dion, but, you know, I think it was that – the loss of UW in Oregon was like, uh, yeah, this could be problematic. Um, this conference probably can't survive with the remaining seven teams. And then, you know, hours later, Arizona, Arizona State, and uh, and Utah all bail. So uh, I think, for me, the death blow was, was UW in Oregon. I, I thought it could survive without the L.A. schools. So I haven't been thinking this all year, the last year and year and a half, that, oh, it's done now. USC and UCLA are gone. Uh, but when UW in Oregon left, that's when I said, uh, yeah, the Pac-12 is probably in some uh, some trouble here. And it is interesting to hear that from your perspective because we, you know, we've been covering realignment here on, on our our show, you know, since Texas No You left, you know, and and how that affected us down here in Big Twelve country and and all that. And then to hear it from people, especially from Oregon State and Washington State, were both really optimistic that it was going to stick together and and think that there was nothing. And then just depending on where you were in the country, like, no, there's no way. It is interesting to hear that, like, inside of it, like, yes, it made a whole lot more sense for them to stay together, especially when you look at the 10 teams that left. Had they just taken the Apple deal, they're all about getting the same money without having to travel as much. 
So it's a little bit weird that it all wound up the way it did. Right. And I think that's so much of the frustration is, you know, Washington State and Oregon State are looking, first off, they're looking at a lot of the programs that are getting into these conferences. And, you know, there's an understanding of, of the markets and the TV money and so on. But, you know, I think, I think for the Cougars, they look at, at Arizona and they look at Colorado again prior to this year. And, you know, these are two programs that have been largely irrelevant on the national stage for a long time. And that's not to say Washington State and Oregon State have been, you know, going to Rose Bowls every year. But these are programs that have had winning seasons for several years now. Washington State has consistently run Arizona right off the field every time they've played. Um, so I think, you know, in Arizona's got the basketball draw. They've got, you know, a bigger market in Tucson. And, again, I think there's a lot of understanding of that. I think the frustration comes from, you know, a lot of these decisions, they're not made off merit. I mean, Cal and Stanford are going into a uh, power conference. Stanford obviously has incredible women's sports, but their football team has been off the, the map for a few years. Their men's basketball team has been off the map. I mean, Cal, quite frankly, is, is not particularly good at anything or hasn't been lately. So I think there's some frustration that comes with that. And then I think, you know, it's, uh, you look at the money. Yeah, I mean, Washington and Oregon are taking half shares. I mean, so many of these schools are taking almost no money for, for what exactly? You know, to the bigger brand name. Yeah, I get that. You know, and I, I saw a lot of arguments from, especially from Washington and Oregon fans, is, yeah, we get these big, uh, these big games, Ohio State and, and Michigan okay, you also were playing Rutgers and you're playing Northwestern and, and no disrespect to those programs, but, you know, it's not like you're going 12 weeks, 10 weeks of we're playing a ranked team on national TV on uh, the pro- the grand stage every week. You're going to play a lot of 9 a.m. kickoffs on Peacock uh, and East Piscataway that, you know, isn't going to get that much attention. So I think there were a lot of factors uh, that, that kind of contributed to the frustration for Washington State and Oregon State largely – Though so it's just it's the fact that the merit of the two schools and their athletic programs weren't getting into some of these conferences, whereas that isn't necessarily true for some of the others. Jamie, great stuff. Enjoy the game tomorrow. I'm sure it's going to be wild, wild, and hey, fun man. to watch. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Jamie Vinnick, Cougfan.com. Jack, he's he's going in the rotation.